Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Zuzanna Varsa. I'm the Director of Research at Open Future. And I would like to welcome all of you to the last panel of this, uh, of this uh, wonderful conference. I know we stand between you and the, and the final drink, so we'll keep the panel exciting. Um, <laughs> We, I have with me a group of excellent experts uh, who, who bring a wealth of experience and expertise, starting on my right, Adriana Groch, co-founder of the Sovereign Tech Fund, um, Francesca Bria, uh, economist, policy expert, and also former uh, director of the Italian National Innovation Fund, Paul Keller, director of re uh, not research policy at Open Future, uh, our gracious host, host who requires no introduction, Aster, welcome. And last but not least, Mikhail Lenners, who's the strategy director at NLNet. And uh, for the next 40 minutes, we'll be making the case for the big EU open source fund. And I'm delighted to be moderating this discussion because uh, we are at a very interesting moment in time. Just two days ago, I attended a conference here in Brussels on antitrust regulation and the new world order, organized and chaired by the amazing Christina Cafara. Some of you were, uh, were attend attended that conference, some of you spoke there. And uh, one of the main takeaways is, that, is this absolute certainty that we are at an inflection point and that we are witnessing a paradigm shift um, in how we think about in that context, antitrust and competition law, but also regulation more broadly, and related to that, the role of the state in shaping markets, including the digital market. And the common thread running through the panels was, the, was that states cannot repeat the mistakes of the past when it comes to digital markets. The, uh, states and, and, and public institutions cannot stay at the sidelines and hope that the markets will, will handle everything on their own. Um, so, in Europe, that rec recognition has already borne fruit over the last uh, few years. Uh, we have seen the adoption of a number of laws that, that, that were mentioned here already, so the DMA, DSA, etc. And uh, these legal acts at least have an ambition to, to handle the, the biggest challenges of the digital, digital markets head on. And this ambition wouldn't be possible without the mistakes that were made in the past. However, there appears to be an increasing recognition, at least in some circles, that regulation alone will not suffice. Uh, it needs to be coupled with investment and support in digital infrastructure. And this is the topic of today's, uh, of, of, this, of this panel. So later this year, we'll have um, European elections and a new commission will uh, have a new work plan. Mm, and afterwards, the Commission will begin preparing the, uh, for the adoption of the new multi-annual financial framework. So, the timing for putting ideas and making demands uh, could not be better. Uh, and so, the, my first question goes to, to you, Mikhail. I, we've learned um, uh, in the previous presentation that um, the huge majority of projects funded under NGI umbrella is open source. So, in a way, NGI could be considered a prototype for this uh, big EU fund that we want to discuss today. So could you explain, elaborate a little bit more, uh, what do we actually mean when we say funding for open source projects? Because uh, we learned that this, and we heard a lot about innovation, but we know that innovation is not, is not enough, right? We need, uh, we need funding for for maintenance, we need funding for communities, et cetera, et cetera. So how does it look uh, from your experience? So um, if, you, if you look at it, uh, obviously uh, every uh, little pile of money has a tag to it. And NGI was R&D money. It came from the hard traditional uh, uh, piles of money uh, handed out in the cascading. So the limitation that we had is that it had to be R&D. Uh, um, but of course, as we know, in the whole ecosystem, you have the research part, like the, the, the tr traditional innovation part, but the development part also involves fixing things that are wrong. I mean, a developer that has a, a burning house cannot be expected, like has technical debt, cannot be expected to innovate. So you need to, to solidify these, these efforts. And then, of course, uh, we also see that at the scale that we're operating with 80,000 people in, in the ecosystem, 1,000 projects that are, uh, that, that are touched. 
uh, capacity becomes a problem. There are not enough chip designers in Europe. There are not enough open hardware people in Europe. There are not enough protocol experts in Europe. So you need to grow them. So in some cases, we had to actually start whole educational programs just to keep up our own capacity to support the programs. And of course, that's just a proxy of the, uh, of, the, of the actual work happening. So I think the, 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 uh, when we talk about funding, uh, if we have one fund and it has to do maintenance and it has to do research and innovation and it has to do capacity building, maybe we should already be thinking about different funds because they are different problems. One of the problems, for instance, with capacity building is uh, can you afford to, 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 to become good at something if you're in a minority group and you're already facing hardship? If, if, you're, if you're, I guess, over-representing maybe uh, uh, the, the, the open source community is typically uh, over-represented in terms of white males between 20 and, 20 and 55 with a certain uh, higher education. That's, that's, but if we want to build capacity outside of that, we're going to need separate instruments as well. So, so it, it really is a big pile of, 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 of financial need that we have to project. And I think it's a systemic one, just like the Erasmus programs. We want to make students travel across Europe and learn about Europe and build skills and, 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 and see uh, across the borders. Well, maybe for the open source community, we need something similar, systemic. So not something that falls apart when, well, say the European Commission decides to, to take a left turn or a right turn and, and abandon the next generation in internet program, even though it would be stupid to do so because it's the best program since sliced bread. <laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, Adriana, how, how does it look like from your perspective? You're the co-founder of Sovereign Tech Fund, and uh, although it's, uh, it's still quite young, uh, it can provide a blueprint for, for what we're talking about uh, today. So how do you see those challenges in, in funding open source? And can the lessons learned at the national level, in your opinion, be translated into, into the EU level, how the two might interact, and maybe what are some of the common misconceptions about funding open source, public funding open source? We have 30 minutes and 50 seconds <laughs> for this answer. Um, no, where do I start now? Um, there were multiple questions, so maybe about the blueprint first. I think what we need is more actors in this field and not less, um, especially actors coming in with public money for the public interest. Um, it's not about driving anyone out, it's by bringing more actors in, creating desired resilience and also, dare I say it, uh, redundancy. It's a good thing because, as you said, you can take turns and then if you have just one or two actors um, providing support, that is very dangerous for a community that supports on that kind of support. So it's about the, the, the actors, how many, and what kind of mission they have. And the blueprint um, the Sovereign Tech Fund provides is now just another uh, addition for how we can learn to scale things up quickly. Um, in, in my opinion, I think uh, it's good to start with a laser focus on very specific tasks in maybe a smaller uh, environment, and then to scale up, then to say, <coughs> This is a very big mission, as you said, many questions, um, and come very top down, and then learning on the way, oh, it doesn't even work. Instead, maybe start smaller, and then combine forces and build up. And I think the learnings do definitely apply, because uh, we're not looking um, with a narrow, narrow, narrow focus when it comes to location. So we're, the German uh, Sovereign Tech Fund is not funding in Germany. Um, we're looking internationally for projects. Um, we heard that also before, um, I think Gab said it in his um, words, uh, it's very important to also not limit this international co-creation and cooperation in the community. So also the programs we design need to take into account how the, how the community works. And there was a third question. The common misconceptions. What was the biggest surprise the, for you when the, you started? Yeah, absolutely. The common misconception is, um, I think, um, to always look at the end product first and not think about all the underlying work that needs to happen. So really take into account the chain 
of steps and software comp components involved and communities involved um, and have a holistic approach to really uh, create impact. Um, I know it's more attractive to, to do something you can showcase, especially working uh, with uh, the public sector. They also like that you can showcase things and the more invisible it becomes, the harder it gets. Also, there is no glory in prevention. All those things uh, come into play and they make it sometimes really hard to do the work that is very necessary. Uh, also, funds are always limited. We are work working with uh, taxpayers' money, so um, that needs to be taken into account. Also, we work with public procurement laws. That makes it more hard. So, look where you can have a leverage effect and do the work that is maybe harder and less attractive, but do it good because it will scale and create some real impact. Um, and then see how this fertile ground leads to some really nice effects. But do not just look at one layer and forget about the rest and think it will sort itself out because it will not. Thanks for that. Paul, uh, Open Future has been arguing for a uh, European Digital Infrastructure Fund. And the uh, economic arguments uh, speak to the imaginations when we hear trillions we imagine very, very, very big numbers, but uh, what other arguments speak in favor of um, establishing a fund in, in other words, what problems would such a fund solve? So I think um, we've, we've talked about this idea of a public digital infrastructure fund um, without necessarily having an exact instrument in mind, but I think we need to shift the discussion. Like I find it very instrumental what uh, Michiel said at the beginning about, if you look how we created this opportunity for the NGI, right? Like it's carved out of like the research pillar of the EU's budget that comes with certain constraints on the logic as you described. Um, and we will either be carved, like these activities will be carved out of a pillar or we will need to argue for our own pillar. And in that sense, like this idea of public digital infrastructure or digital public infrastructure is very strategic, right? Like we, we need to make a case why there is a part of society about a part of our societies in the digital realm that needs to be treated separately, that needs to be thought at the very beginning of budget discussions. And uh, you mentioned this is essentially the multi-annual financial framework, a discussion that will take place or like that will, will, will become visible in 2027 again. But we need to be strategic about how we want to position ourselves going in there. And I found it very encouraging to, to hear sort of some of the lessons on the foundations panel earlier today where it was about sort of reflection on how this community which is present here sort of understood that there is a necessity to act together for a, a, a common interest in interfacing with policymakers, um, that's often very reactive, right? Like, but we need to realize and when there is regulatory measures to be reactive is often sort of what needs to be done. What we tend to forget is that the, the other side of what public institutions do, budget, plan, is like a very predictable process. We can tell you right now, these discussions will be in 2027. And so we need to have this narrative that says um, there is a need to invest in infrastructure, which carries with it these notions with a stronger focus on things like maintenance of successful products and essential products, but also maybe carries notions of investing into institutions that can carry this infrastructure with it. That, that narrative, that discussion needs to start now. And I would encourage like the foundations, the the other stakeholders in this space to, to realize that the earlier you realize and the earlier you, you, you invest into taking position with an eye to these discussions which are to come, the more successful we are going to be um, hopefully in, in three to four years where we don't have to carve out something out of another budget line, but maybe we can be a budget line. Can I shortly respond to that? Is that the... the maybe let's, let's do the first round and then... A round of responses. Um, 
because I wanted Astor to you to comment on on this because I, I, our focus right now is the public funding for uh, for open source, but uh, and, and that could be seen as this uh, sign of this new wave of approach towards um, shaping digital markets, stronger role of the state, etc. But do you see a place for uh, for private? Funding in such a in such a European fund. Do you think that these two are exclusionary, or or could could you see like a cooperation between between the two sources? Well, that comes down to like a fairly interesting like governance question of this specific fund. But if we take a few steps back and just look at let's say funding into the open source or digital commons ecosystem. Um, I think we need to I actually use a simpler dichotomy than Michiel uh, with his four. I essentially think of like innovation or new, funding new things and then maintaining old or existing things. And on the question of maintaining old and existing things, um, the big question is why aren't the companies paying more? And I really want to point out that a bunch of companies do pay a lot. We have OpenSSF, for example. There are investment vehicles in order to maintain this commons. But just like any commons, there is still a sustainability challenge in that a large number of companies extract or realize, depending on how you see it, huge amounts of value out of open source. The fact that there is a sustainability challenge while so much value is created, I think begs the question, is not like, do they have a role? It's just, why does the government even have to th think about this? Well, but the answer there is, you learn it in Economics 101. It's a commons challenge. And uh, so I think if there's something this, that should com come with government funding, it's also figuring out the governance structures that need to be put in place to increase the private funding into the sustainability challenge as well, because commons are not a private or public thing. It's that peculiar thing in the middle. Um, but then when it comes to funding new things, well, I don't know exactly what the, will be important decisions made by whoever sets up this fund, but private companies they are going to fund commons in the future as well. They already are. Companies are building together open source every day. And they are putting resources and money into this. And I think here, the important thing that governments also have to understand is that there is a massive ecosystem already in place. And they are, in this case, joining something that already exists and they're not creating something new. But I am, you know, always here with a word of caution around those things. Thanks for that. Francesca, um, the, one of the risks of the greater involvement of, of states in shaping the digital markets is that uh, idea of a big state, right? So the, the risk is that if we went fighting big tech, we end up with a big state. I, I recall you, you mentioning that uh, last time I saw you speak. So. Can you, can you elaborate on that? What, what are your thoughts on that? Is there like a middle way, like a third way that, that we can design? Yeah, thank you. First of all, I think it's quite strange that a, a panel on money happens at the end <laughs> of, the, of the entire conference, because I would think, you know, this is why you gather all this big community. The message, I think, to policymakers, to Europe, it's obvious, no? It's like, here we need to think how to strengthen, how to scale, how to invest. I think you want to be pretty clear about that uh, from the upfront at the beginning. Obviously, what you're all saying is a lot of things are working. We have a lot of initiatives. Um, they are probably fragmented. Uh, we want to see Europe stepping up and make this a fundamental challenge for Europe's future. I think this, in my view, this should be the big message and for a lot of different reasons because obviously Europe needs a Europe stuck. I think we all agree on that 
and that Europe stuck we don't okay fine but I mean this is this is then a conversation that we should have does Europe need to have a Europe stuck that is open sovereign and independent and why do we need why do we understand as Europeans that technological sovereignty is also economic sovereignty is also political sovereignty but it is also about you know, environmental and social sustainability. Uh, this is a vision that I think, you know, it's like giving a directionality to technological advancement in a way that you want to benefit society at large. And I think that's the place where Europe can make a difference to say we have an agenda, technology and economic agenda for public interest. For people first, because we understand that, you know, uh, artificial intelligence, digitization is massively changing society. We have seen it during the, the pandemic, you know, what it means for education, what it means for healthcare, what it means for the labor market, what it means for cities that are becoming digital and green. So we know that this is a massive transformation of our societies, and I think that's where Europe can really make a difference. Going to your point, I've been always advocating that you have a third way for Europe to come in, which doesn't mean bad competition, it's good competition. So if you have the tech, the big tech giants from Silicon Valley and you have the big state model of China, I think there is a third way for Europe which is technology in the public interest. And I think if you look to the regulatory, okay, what are the problems? Maybe we don't agree on Europe stuck, but let's see if we agree on the problems. So I think the first problem, and you mentioned the uh, competition uh, conference and antitrust conference, it's a massive concentration on power. Do I need, we, we agree on that, great. Okay, so we do have an unprecedented industrial concentration of power in the digital economy. And I think that's a, po that's, that's a space where Europe is doing its, I think, good, you know, good role. So we are saying we are we are regulating the digital economy. You mentioned some of the regulatory standards that we're putting in place. Of course, we hope they're global standards. But I think you know now there is an antitrust investigation, for example, on OpenAI and Microsoft deal. Let's see what comes out of that. I mean, there was Lina Khan from the FTC authority. She was pretty determined, and I think our colleagues at DG Connect will do a good job in trying to, you know, create a much better um, regulatory framework for the digital age. Now, we also understand this is not enough. The DSA, the DMA, the, you know, all the different regulation, even the AI Act, they're closing it today, if I'm not wrong. I look at commission people. Anyway, it's happening. This is not enough. That's why we have a digital industrial strategy. I think this was very much needed. It is really much needed because you know how much investment you need. And if you look at the, at the numbers, I'm sorry to say, we do have a technological sovereignty problem. Over 80%, maybe even over 90% of critical dependency. Cloud, chips, Raw critical raw materials, AI, data, we do not control the key infrastructures layer in the digital economy. So this is a problem. It's a problem of economic security, of competitiveness, but also of social welfare. And that's where I get to the point that yes, digital industrial strategy is good, but it's not enough only to copy the models that are out there. So I'm not advocating for Europe to have its big tech, I think what you're doing here is what Europe should have, which is an open, so sovereign, uh, independent ecosystem of technologies in public interest, but this needs a 10 billion fund. It doesn't need, I'm sorry, I mean, I just want to throw the provocation because I think we are all aware what it takes to maintain and build good software, what it takes to innovate on top of the infrastructure, what it takes to control you know, from the chips to the level up to the, to the software, to the data. And on top of that, and I finish, I wrap up, build good digital services for citizens. I've been working as a CTO in the city of Barcelona. I know that the narrative cannot only be for geeks. I'm sorry, like we can't just say we comply to EU policy. We want to say we have services for you that will improve your life. 
You know, we want to have actual pan-European interoperable digital open sovereign services that work for citizens. Do we get there? Do we agree on that? Okay, <laughs> but do we get there? I mean, just... Thank you. Yes. B bravo, amen. Uh, Francesca, you, uh, you uh, called out several elephants in the room, so uh, I think I will give the rest of the panel the chance to either react to what the others said, or I will just reiterate two of those elephants. One is the question of scale, right? We, I keep hearing, which irritates me a lot, that public fund, funding will never match private funding, and this is as, as if the, 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 the public institutions throw in the towel at the beginning. That being said, it, uh, the, the, the question of the scale just repeats that, that uh, logic of the, of the private industry where, where bigger is better. Maybe bigger isn't always better. Well, maybe we don't need to match the private funding. Well, maybe we can find a different way. And the other elephant in the room to me is that even the European institutions rely on proprietary software. And how do we move away from that? So whoever wants to react to the question of scale, to anything else. Um, Adriana, you are first. No, just very briefly, I mean, we have the instruments in place now. We just need to scale them up. I mean, we know what we're doing, right? So we know how it works. We know how to scout for the technologies. We know how to contract them. Uh, we have um, some, some ideas in pilot stage, we have some things that are running smoothly, so we're ready if there's a commitment, and I think this is coming back to what, what Paul said and Francesca said about uh, there needs to be an understanding um, of this mission. So yeah, in other words, what we ne need is political will. It's a, it, it must be. And mission, what yeah. we need to do is generate that political will. So, so I think, I think uh, if, if we look at what the Commission has been doing, for instance, in its own house, uh, they, they, we're one of the smallest programs they've done. And arguably the most successful, precisely because we weren't drowned by saying, well, why don't you do all of everything? But instead we do small things at a human scale. So the developers in the open source community are humans. And we, we take their talents. We couldn't scale them up if we wanted to. That's why we need slow and capacity building. We can, we can, we can do more, but if, if you give us 100 times more budget, I'm very sure we would drown in it. It, it would literally attract all the wrong actors. So, so I think the ambition, ultimately, we scale to a, a big amount because I think we can pay for, 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 for our own upkeep. And it's, 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 it's like, and, but also can I want to- Can we afford to wait? What? Can we afford to wait and well, we, keep we, it we, slow? We, I, th I think we can scale up and double it and triple it, and, but, but uh, doing it a hundred times, uh, maybe that's a, uh, in, in one go, that, that, that might be a bit... But also I want to, to take the notion of funding a bit apart, because um, imagine, close your eyes, and you can now pick a place where you sleep in an apartment building. It's either Tokyo or Ankara. What do you choose? It's, it's literally simple. There's going to be an earthquake, and you can choose do you choose the, the policy where there's no infrastructure, uh, government has let everything go, there's no policy, there's no structure. What we do inside NGI is a lot of quality assurance. We have audits on everything. We, do, uh, we, we package everything. We do accessibility scans. And that's, that's funding that's not going to projects. That's, projects to go to, that's funding going to other people checking up on these projects. If, you're, if, uh, if, if there's an earthquake in Ankara, many people die. If there's an earthquake in Tokyo, everybody gets out of the building safe. And I think the, the digital commons that we're building, if we, if we really want to structure them in a, in a same way, we also have the, 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 the mechanism steering the quality, steering the whole ecosystem, because it's not just funding small isolated things, it's building the whole common ground. I, I think say. that was something also uh, said before that publishing the code is just one percent, right? And building the community around it, the ecosystem, support for that community is, is, is what is needed. Asar, I know you wanted to comment. Yeah, I was just waiting and thank you, Francesca. Finally, we got a number on the table to compare things with. Uh, the, um, coming back to my old point, about innovation, creating new, and maintaining old. The funny thing with the software is that you create new by using 
a lot of already created software. And that is why I think there might be an important distinction just in the conversation about very clearly different strategies around the maintenance, which is not a big competition question. It is not a zero-sum game. We are all depending on this software, be it uh, Europe as challengers in digital markets or countries who have the largest tech companies in the world. We're all dependent on this stuff. And I think that probably politically it will be very valuable to separate these conversations as well because, as I said in my initial statement here today, there is an international space station element of open source sustainability where, you know, if it's a 10 billion fund, 2 billion fund, 100 billion fund, I hope that what we're building with, we have made sure to invest into that material and make that stable. It doesn't matter, we need to get that done first. And that is a global challenge and not a European challenge. Paul, over to you. Yeah, I just wanna respond a little bit to, to, to that assumption that it's difficult to scale. Like I think that is, that is <coughs> one type of work and that doesn't scale what you describe, right? Like, or at least not to the scale of 10 billion, but um, the, yeah, thank you. <laughs> but what, what is missing, like when you build infrastructure, right? Like you, you do not have the people who do the building who draw the plans for the infrastructure. You do not have, and, and sort of like that individual work which scales difficult, it needs to organize on a societal level. It needs to come, it needs to be driven by this idea about the society you want to have and the society that you want to build. And so there's to some degree building capacity to build this infrastructure in an open way, but we also need to relearn as society or we need to reclaim this space of envisaging this infrastructure, in drawing the plans that need to be built and need to be filled. And what for me still is one of the things we need to think, and I come back to the foundations, foundations are maybe one example, but we probably need to think about other types of institutions for the digital age that help us doing this, that help us building these things. I'm still waiting for sort of what, why are we constraining our public institutions, the libraries, the research institutions, why are they largely constrained by the market, are pushed out of the digital realm? We need to give them a role back at the center of these types of digital societies that we want to build. We need them to identify what type of infrastructures that we need. We need to make them the, the centers of these services for citizens that are delivered, that are useful, and we need, we need both. We need the, we need the, the tools and the, the, the ingenuity that comes from developing software, but to some degree we also need to build these bigger lines in which need to be filled by those software systems. That, uh, that makes me think of a metaphor I've heard uh, recently that Europe cannot, uh, cannot be a playground but must be a player, right? And it seems that these institutions, these public interest institutions have become like a playground for big tech and now we want to turn them into actual players. Francesca. Yeah, I think I want to... Uh, I want to mention another elephant in the room. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> just, just at the very end. So I think we can also agree about the fact, <laughs> he's going to say no, <laughs> about the fact, <laughs> uh, <it>. yeah, <laughs> about the fact that the business model isn't working. I mean, I think this is, uh, for me, uh, a massive business thing model. that the, the business model of of digital platforms. I mean, I think that the question, and it was mentioned a little bit, but I think not too much. So the question that uh, monetizing and manipulating personal information and data is undermining European democracy, is undermining democracy overall, but it's certainly very, very concerning. This is still the, the main business model of the digital age. It is also a question of digital trade. I mean, now, nowadays, if you look at digital trade, the core is data. It's not even trading, you know, products and services. It's the trading of data. And we have seen the massive, you know, effect that this has on 
democracy on all of us. I mean, not only because it discriminates, but also because, you know, massive disinformation, uh, massive, you know, we're going to see also during the election this year, which is a very, very important part for us as liberal democracies. And this is very clear also in the AI Act, obviously. So how do we turn away this mis business model that creates, because it's, it's the business model that creates these problems. So if you say, you know, yes, we are asking a companies to actually clean their platforms and to monitor and so on. But if the business model isn't working, then we have to change the business model. And I, I expect this community to move away from that kind of surveillance capitalism, this, uh, you know, business model that doesn't work into a very different, more sustainable business model that also redistributes and creates public value. And yes, that benefits small companies, uh, you know, small businesses, workers, citizens, and a variety of people. Because it, there, there is a massive concentration of power there. And the data, you know, is at the very center of this, of this power. We're absolutely running out of time from what I see, right? We have yeah, like... we have two and a half minutes. We have two and a half minutes. So see. let's organize a conference on that topic. But uh, before we do that, um, yeah. closing remarks. Let's start with you. Um, okay, closing. Okay, I... I mean... Yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 we have to. We are also the ones who are holding back yes. drinks. Uh, so, yeah. Um, um, so then maybe I come, I pick up uh, what, what Astor uh, said, and just as a reminder, um, we have a number and we, we identify a need, and now it's like, how does this fit in? What is the mission? What is the strategy? So just uh, to tell uh, briefly the story of the Sovereign Tech Fund, we are with the Ministry of Economic Affairs in Germany. So the money is, is, is coming from, from them. Um, and uh, we were incubated as a new organization that is having this new mission of investing in the foundations for, um, for, for many other players uh, at the Agency for Disruptive Innovation. So it is not two separate things, uh, definitely not. And I think this is one of the angles that we need to understand and that we need to talk more about. This is not like handing out some nice... Uh, easy money gifts to some people who do like really valuable work. No, it, this is like really critical and uh, we need to have long-term goals and a strategic mission how to support the individuals, the organizations, how to tie together different actors and, and do match funding. It's also about the companies, of, of course, um, and, and there needs to be some real vision in this field. Thanks, Mikael. Over to you. Your final remarks. Okay, the final remark is... I, I, 15 seconds. Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> A, I'm very much looking forward to big society instead of big state or big... So, so I'm, I'm a big fan of, of doing this the way through civil society. And the, the second thing is we also need to clean up. And the cleaning up of uh, basically when new projects come into the world, old projects have to die. And we have to learn how to do that. And just maintenance of everything is impossible. We will have octogenarians uh, ruling the world, the big mastodons, and we need this to have the, uh, a healthy system where we understand how to, well, evolve the ecosystem and deprecate decade-old technologies that are still dominant. And that is a challenge that is extremely hard, intellectually very challenging, but we need to solve that in addition to all the other things that were mentioned. Great, thank you. Esther. Yeah, I may be correcting, uh, I started talking about, oh, this is a global challenge, etc. Sometimes when you say that something is a global challenge, uh, some nation states shy away from taking it their own, it becomes like a common problem in and of itself. So let me revert back from that and just kind of put a challenge to Europe. We might be challenger in the digital markets, but we're not poor. Why, I would be incredibly proud if Europe went out, even if it's not Europe's job, and we went out and took the lead and secured open source for the world. And we did that. And that will require so much innovation of auditing. There will be maintenance. There will be understanding what we need to leave behind. But let's just do it. I would be incredibly proud if we just took that responsibility on ourselves. Beautiful call to action. Paul, your call to action. It, my, my call to action was to some degree in the first intervention, right? Like it is a call to action to this community that we need to think strategically about securing the 
nascent support for these infrastructures will brought us here, which brought like all of these thousand projects that we heard about into, not into being, but like allowed us to support them, to grow them, to nurture them, um, allowed some of them to fail. And we need to, we need to think strategically about the learnings from this and then building on the learnings, we need to make the case for expanding this. Uh, that's a challenge for all of us in this room for the next three years. Francesca. Yeah, um, very simple. Just uh, change the narrative, be strategic, take, put together what works now, the initiative that works, connect them, put forward a plan, and turn NGI into a 10 billion European tax sovereignty fund. It's very simple. Thank you. Thank you.